Uh, so I'm um, assigned to give this update on the markers of glycemic control. Um, so that's what I'm going to cover today, essentially talk about the glycated hemoglobin, in particular HbA1c. I think it's a molecule that we are very sort of, uh, aware of and it's, uh, it's an important tool for our, in our sort of clinical practice. Uh, I'll update the audience of some of the changes in terms of the reporting of HbA1c as well as the changes in the targets of glycemic control. So Suyin has mentioned about individualization. I'll just sort of expand on that point. And I'll end with just a, a slide on uh, the use of glucometer uh, for patients to perform self-monitoring of blood glucose. So uh, uh, we know about uh, uh, hemoglobin A1c, which is a reflection of the average glycemia over the past two to three months. So it's a very uh, valuable tool for us to use. So uh, we still feel that HbA1c is, uh, at the moment, the best glycemic marker we have. So we are sort of recommending that A1c should be performed routinely in all patients with diabetes at initial assessment and then as part of the follow-up. So be very careful when I say it's at initial assessment. This is not meant to be used as a diagnostic tool. So I think uh, Prof. Tai Yishong will expand on that about the use of HbA1c in terms of the diagnosis. So this is meant for initial assessment as a baseline that you have before you initiate pharmacotherapy. And then you can follow up and look at the HbA1c improvement uh, and whether they manage to hit the sort of proposed individualized HbA1c target. So uh, just a brief recap of the, uh, uh, of the molecule itself. So HbA1c obviously is a subfraction of the hemoglobin sort of uh, uh, molecule. So um, involves the glycation at the end terminal of the amino acid at the beta chain of the hemoglobin. And the sort of uh, biochemical <coughs> name is that of beta N1, the oxy hemoglobin. So this is the particular moiety that we want to measure in the lab, very specific, HbA1c, not other subfractions. So in terms of the lab measurement, I'll have a slide later on what we should be uh, careful of. So if you have looked through the chapter on glycemic control, you realize that the HbA1c is reported both in percentage as well as a new unit called the millimoles per mole. So this refers to the millimoles HbA1c per mole of hemoglobin. So uh, a lot of uh, uh, literature, I mean, in, in PubMed, if you read through articles, they usually report both in percentage as well as the IFCC unit, which is the millimoles per mole. So um, what is the background to this sort of new reporting structure that was sort of introduced uh, since 2010? And a lot of local labs, I uh, believe, they are also reporting in these two units. So this is a background to the standardization history of this HbA1c. So way back in 1977, the glycated hemoglobin was first used in routine clinical lab, but what they have measured was the HbA1, not the subfraction of A1, A1, A1b or A1c. So that was very back more than 30 years ago. However, in 1993, I mean the landmark trial called the Diabetes Control and Complication Trial was published. And in it, they obviously showed that the use of intensive control in patients with type 1 diabetes resulted in a lower risk of microvascular complications. So since the publication of DCCT, I mean, uh, we began to know that HbA1c was an excellent predictor of diabetes-related long-term complication. Of course, this was done in type 1 diabetes, but there was a subsequent UK PDS trial in type 2 diabetes. And in the DCCT, HbA1c was reported in percentage. So um, following the publication, HbA1c became the new global standard for determining glycemic status because it's a reflection of the glycemia over the past two to three months. It's very useful. It's not dependent on the food intake at the moment of the blood test. So uh, many centers begin to adopt HbA1c. However, there was a very big problem. Obviously, in the DCCT trial, all the lab uh, used a very standardized way of measurement, the assay that they use. However, if you go to other countries or developing countries, there were really a lack of international standardization. So the A1C obtained from this country may not be comparable to that from the other country. And if it's not standardized, you cannot really infer the risk of complication by looking at the HbA1C uh, value. So hence, in 1996, um, the National Glycohemoglobin Standardization Program was actually uh, launched in the United States. Uh, its mission is to standardize the way that HbA1C is test is being done and reported, and they actually selected a reference method based on the HPLC sort of platform. 
So with that method, they went uh, I mean, across the United States and other countries to try to standardize the process. So if you want to call your lab HB1C assay as DCCT aligned, you have to follow the method or the reference method that the uh, NGSP proposed. And if you follow the uh, process, your lab can be NGSP certified and you can report in terms of DCCT HBA1C in percentage point. So that was good for a while, but obviously the, to the purists, reporting an analyte in percentage is not really precise. Most analytes, sodium, potassium, you report in millimoles per liter, the actual concentration. So there was a movement uh, in the uh, early 2000s that uh, perhaps the HP1C should be reported in the SI units. So there was this um, International Federation of Clinical Chemistry, which selected a new reference method, which is more accurate um, than the OHBLC method. So they base it on mass spectrometry or capillary electrophoresis to measure the particular HbA1c molecule that I alluded to earlier. So because of this accurate measurement, they actually use the unit of millimoles per moles as the reporting. So if you look at the uh, reporting of uh, HbA1c in millimoles per moles, it creates a problem for the practicing physician. You look at the value of 42. I really don't know how to interpret. So you must uh, obviously, if you look at 7%, it's 53. So we need to learn the new number, just like using milligram per deciliter or millimoles per liter. It takes some time to get used to. So in 2010, when this was launched, it sort of recommended that all labs report in both percentage as well as millimoles per mole. And how do we convert? There's a master equation if you really want to convert. But most labs now report in both units, so it's easier for us, the practicing clinician. We are very used to the percentage. We were not sure whether eventually they will drop the percentage once everybody have gotten used to the millimoles per mole. But 7% is 53, so that's the 53 to cut off. Okay, so that's for HB1C standardization. So how does it translate to our clinical practice? So we recommend that the measurement of HB1C should be done in laboratories that utilize DCCT aligned assays, uh, which means that this assay is NGSP certified and they are able to trace the method to the IFCC or DCCT reference method. So uh, if you send your blood works to the major lab in Singapore, you wouldn't run into any trouble. Most of the labs are uh, using NGSP certified assay. However, there are a lot of point of care devices. Uh, please be careful, look up the uh, manufacturer, whether the assay that they use are sort of a DCCT aligned. If they are aligned, then it shouldn't be a problem. So the other um, 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 uh, sort of a, um, point that I'll bring across is this HB1C uh, frequency of testing. Um, there's no change from the last guideline in 2006. Essentially, three to four monthly for patients with unstable glycemic control or those who have failed to meet the treatment goals or those that require intensive form of insulin therapy. You really want to bring them back every three to four months. There are some patients that are very stable. I mean, six to seven percent uh, um, after a few visits, you can actually uh, lower the frequency perhaps to six monthly. So this is another point that um, um, we often take it for granted. So this is an interesting study that was done uh, more than 10 years ago, whereby the patients are randomized into two groups. The first group have the HbA1c result available at the point of consultation. The second group have the HbA1c result after the consultation. So we actually showed that those who have the HB1C ready at the point of consultation resulted in more intensification of the treatment, resulting in better A1C control. So in the SOC, we always take it for granted. Patient do your blood test a few days before TCU or on arrival. But in the primary care, just to bring across the point, it would be good if you have the HBA1C at the point of consultation so that you can intensify the treatment if necessary. A lot of times after the patient visit, it's always difficult to recall and then explain the rationale for intensification. So uh, the other point to take note is that HB1C test is subject to certain interference, particularly in our region, Southeast Asia. We know that HBE thalassemia is quite prevalent. If you uh, adopt the HPLC method of measurement, the HBE may co-elute with the HBA1C, causing some form of interference to the result. So we have to be careful, and this is part of the reason why we are uh, a bit wary to use HbA1c as the diagnostic uh, criteria in Singapore. So obviously there are other hemoglobin variants that we have to be careful. Fortunately, a lot of the new assays are based on immunoassay, which will sort of not be affected by these variants. However, there are conditions that affect the red blood cell turnover. 
you have recovery from acute blood loss or hemolytic anemia. There's a lot of new, young red blood cells. Your HbA1c will be spuriously low. In chronic renal failure, they may have carbamylated form of hemoglobin, which may cause, cause interferences as well. As well, and a lot of patients actually receive erythropoietin therapy. This will actually speed up the cell formation of reticulocytes, again, causing the HbA1c to be lower than expected. So if you have some chronic renal failure patients or those on end stage, sometimes their HbA1c seems to be much lower than reflected by their capillary glucose monitoring. So we have to be careful about that. And lastly, iron deficiency anemia is very common in our setting. This actually causes the HbA1c to be higher than expected, no, not the other way around. So in terms of targets of glycemic control, I think we are aware of the UK PDS showing that a tight glycemic control uh, at the point of diagnosis results in a lower uh, microvascular complication risk. This was um, uh, uh, during the trial period. They, did not, they failed to show the cardiovascular advantages, but during the subsequent 10 years follow-up post-trial, they show that the early glycemic control does have a legacy effect in terms of reducing macrovascular complication risk. So this is a very powerful slide that we need to act hard, act early at the start of the uh, journey for the diabetic patients, such that the, there's a legacy effect, their risk of complication eventually can be reduced. So if you look at the old guideline in 2006, it comes in the table form showing ideal, optimal, suboptimal, and unacceptable glycemic targets. So we have done away with that uh, in, uh, in line with a lot of guidelines in the overseas centers. So this is the take-home message for today. The targets for glycemic control should be individualized. And how do we individualize it? So the general target, we are still adopting a less than 7% or 53 uh, in terms of the HbA1c. So um, this, there's no change compared to the 2006 guidelines. In terms of fasting glucose, between 4 to 7 millimoles, 2-hour post-meal, less than 10 millimoles per liter. So these are the general guidelines for non-pregnant adults with type 1 or type 2 diabetes. But we recognize there's a subgroup of patients uh, whereby lowering of HbA1c may be considered particularly for the type 2 diabetic patients, if this can be achieved without significant hypoglycemia. We know that the newer classes of uh, anti-diabetic drugs have lower risk of hypoglycemia, and certainly we can bring down the A1C to a lower level. And this is based on uh, essentially a landmark trial called the ADVANCE trial. Uh, this is a patient with a um, pretty advanced stage of diabetes, and they were randomized to intensive treatment to bring down the HbA1c down to 6.5% versus the standard control group. And they continue to show that there are benefits by bringing down the H1C to such a lower level, uh, particularly in terms of nephropathy, the reduction of albuminuria. So uh, how do we choose the patients? For those with an early onset of diabetes, short duration of diabetes, those younger patients with a longer life expectancy, and those without any significant cardiovascular disease. I think we can be a bit more intensive such that um, um, there's this sort of legacy effect subsequently and their risk can be reduced. But we recognize there's another group of patients whereby tight control may not be that ideal. So less stringent A1C target ranging from 7 to 8.5% may be adopted for this group of patients, particularly those who are vulnerable to the harmful effects associated with tight glycemic control. So how did this come about? So from the ACCORD study, is another trial whereby they want to use intensive control to bring down the HP1C to 6%. Obviously, they failed to achieve 6%, but in the intensive group, 6.3% uh, was achieved over a very sh rapid intensification phase of up to three to four months. And in fact, there is an increased risk of mortality of about 22%, and the trial was so prematurely terminated. So since then, I mean, uh, a lot of guidelines has changed to recognize that for patients with very advanced stages of diabetes, uh, we should be less strict in terms of glycemic control. So patients with very long duration of disease, with known history of severe hypoglycemia, frequent admissions to the hospital or frequent documentation of hypoglycemia, those with advanced atherosclerosis, as well as those advanced age. I think it's fair to sort of back off. If they can hit 7, 7.5% 7 without significant hypoglycemia, that's fine. For some, you may just have to live with maybe about close to 8%. Uh, but these are the specific groups you want to be very careful. So this is a good sort of uh, a summary slide. So someone who is uh, 
at the early onset of diabetes. You really do want to make use of the data from UK PDS to be very strict. Upfront, you tell the patient, we need to be strict. Let's aim for 6.5% if we can, without any risk of hypoglycemia. But if you're seeing someone with diabetes for 10 years, had a, a bypass done, and, and their A1C is, say, 8 to 9%, you may not want to intensify, like the Accord, a very rapid drop in the HbA1c, that potentially may be harmful. But we know from advanced, intensification is still important, but let's do it gradually and bring down to, say, uh, um, to your target HbA1c in a gradual manner. So this is a two source of spectrum in terms of your patient's profile. So uh, my last slide on self-monitoring of blood glucose. So there are sort of uh, pretty good evidence to suggest that uh, self-monitoring of blood glucose is important for type 1 patients and type 2 patients on insulin treatment. Unfortunately, the data on the use of uh, uh, SMBG in non-insulin users is a bit vague. There are a few landmark trials recently which did not really show the benefit of self-monitoring of blood glucose in the non-insulin user. But nevertheless, we feel that um, uh, this form of monitoring should be considered in certain groups of patients with type 2 diabetes. Those has increased risk of hypoglycemia, particularly those on insulin user or those on sulfonylurea therapy. A glucometer would be useful for them to check and then uh, prevent worsening of the hypoglycemia, particularly by their family members. Obviously, pregnant patients with diabetes and other different ballgame. Those who are experiencing acute illness may cause fluxes in the glycemic excursion, so we have to be careful for that. Um, uh, those who have failed to achieve glycemic goals, sometimes asking them to monitor, make them aware of the bad uh, of the hyperglycemia that they have, and they may sort of spur some modification of their behavior. And currently, we are in the fasting month, so those who are undergoing fasting for our Muslim uh, uh, friends, colleagues, so uh, patients as well, so they should uh, ideally be monitoring more frequently, if possible, to avoid the risk of hypoglycemia. So uh, this is my last slide. So um, I'll pass it to Prof. Sam. Hi, Prof. Hi. Hi, Sean. Sorry.